the that's like the penultimate prize. A new player transitioned to a permanent player, and they transitioned off a of Briar. Now, now everybody's happy, <laughs> not just the new player. <laughs> yeah. Flesh and Blood rewards skill level like no game I've ever seen before. Getting reps, practice, and knowing the field and matchups pays dividends. Skill intensivity requires more of players to hone a single deck in order to see success. So in turn, does this present challenges to newer or casual level players dabbling, but not fully diving into the competitive scene? Here to talk with me about this tonight is my good buddy Blake from the Outcast Haven. We compare and contrast our own metas as well as our playgroups and experience. A huge shout out to our channel members for supporting what we do here. If you want to get involved with the channel and the Dice Commando community, please consider joining as a channel member. Remember, these videos are only possible with your support. You can show that support with a like, a subscribe, and by leaving us a comment and sharing your feedback. Community first, and go Commando. Hey Flesh and Blood folks, welcome back to Dice Commando and go again, a fabulous cast. Joined tonight by, by Blake right above me. How's it going, my friend? It's great. Always great. Talking fab. Yeah, so the, the the Outcast boys are on a uh, brief holiday hiatus. So uh, I I grabbed I grabbed Blake during their normal Thursday recording session, and uh, here we are, second or third time on here. I, I actually don't remember. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, yeah. second or third. <laughs> but all right, yeah. So tonight, um, kind of the the concept that we uh, kind of just crafted a little bit ago in terms of how to how to phrase it, because you know it, it's it's some it can be somewhat of a, a sensitive topic. So. We wanted to, um, you know, be able to phrase it in the correct way so as to not, you know, come out swinging. But I mean, I, I don't think it's a secret to anybody that Flesh and Blood is pretty high skill level game. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if it's the highest skill level game, but I think as I, I think the, the quote you had when we were writing it was it rewards skill level like no game we've ever seen before. Right. Yeah, definitely. So the, the question I have for tonight or the discussion topic for tonight is. You know, there are obvious challenges that will be presented to a new player or a casual player or, or whatever label you want to put on that. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing, but uh, how do we approach, you know, do, is that a real thing? Do, does that matter? Maybe, yeah, maybe that's a better split. Like, does it even matter, right? Mm-hmm. So what do you what do you I, think? I think the, I, I think it does exist, personally. I think that, like, that, there's always some sort of challenge when new players get into the game. I think there are certain things that some games try to do to maybe make their games more new player friendly, or it, it, at least to be perceived that way. I think intentionally or unintentionally, whether rotation is intended to be something that's new player friendly or not, it can be because it kind of shrinks mm. the card pool. Uh, Fab will definitely be one of those games. I know we used to play Dragon Ball Super. And one of the challenges in that game presented was it was three plus years old when we when we started the game it was almost three years old I think is when we started it, so I had three years of cards to catch up on I didn't know the game at all, and I I had a significant learning curve to get into the game, and to some degree Fab presents that same kind of issue, where we already have a decent learning curve because we're over two years in now we have two years worth of cards that people have to catch up on, which is close to maybe a rotation in some games depending on how they rotate but that's definitely an issue but then the skill the skill reward of the game is great but that also means like the skill punish can be pretty high where if you you misunderstand you know i think sometimes people will say it's a made-up thing but tempo is a thing it's just how you describe it is probably the key and i think understanding tempo or trading card advantage and things like that because we do play hand to hand it's a little different is really important and when you do it wrong you can be punished like if you misunderstand how to block and especially some decks can do that maybe more so than others like i always tell people you know katsu and dory are decks that when you first when you first play them you're like god this deck is oppressive because they present a significant learning curve on how to just block them so you're, you're trying to learn how to play your deck and now you gotta learn how to block somebody correctly and that can be really punishing and i think that's where the skill gap immediately starts walking in the door is the first mm-hmm. time you play those decks that punish like a miss block. So I think it's real. I think it exists. I just don't know what the best way to combat that is. 
Yeah, well, I mean, I guess, I mean, there would be people out there listening right now who heard, would say maybe it doesn't need combated, right? It's just, you know, mm-hmm. basically go in, take your licks and learn, um, which which I think is fair. I mean, I, th- I think for me, Fab, I, you know, almost every game, not almost every game I've played, there's the aha moment, right? And mo- oh, most yeah. of the times there's a series of aha moments, but Flesh and Blood seemed to have a lot more aha moments um, for me going in, right? So, I mean, you do have to kind of take your licks to get those. Uh, but on on the other hand... You know, at what point do you just, I mean, th- there are other game options out there, right? So at what point as a new player do you say, you know, the, the 30 bucks that I put into my Dorinthia deck or whatever, I'm just getting pummeled to death, you know, literally, I, I don't know what it might be, but um, at what point do you just abandon and is that a concern? Um, I, I, I honestly don't know. I just think it, I think it's, it, there's been some discussion on this and I thought it was an interesting point. Um, most of it seems to be approached kind of from the complaining side of things. Um, but I, I don't think it has to be taken that way necessarily. I, th- I think there's validity to it. Um, but yeah. Yeah. I think that, I, I think that the, the thing that people forget sometimes in that sense is if you're on the side of like the complexity of the game is good, that's what makes it fab. I, I would agree with you from a competitive standpoint, as somebody who loves to play competitively, who can't get enough of the game, the complexity of it makes it not boring mm-hmm. i can go week to week and play and just keep playing the same deck because it presents new challenges and new puzzles because you're not playing you know we talked about this before but we when you're when you're not playing for like a board state like in magic or some games when you're not playing for a hand advantage like in some games you're playing hand to hand with whatever you know resource generation you can provide from your hand you can obviously manage your pitch and things like that but because you're not playing to a board or hands like advantage state there's a lot of puzzle to solve every hand compared to what you're presented more so than in a lot of games where sometimes if you just draw the right cards you're gifted the opportunity to just say no to certain things and fab doesn't have that ability to have like a lot of games do like a negate or a mm-hmm. counter you can't just say no to something in the same way you're still trading cards for everything you do if you want to say no to an attack you're trading your defense cards for their attack cards so now maybe your turn is is a little bit you know lessened in terms of how effective it is so that you don't take a beating on your turn so it's like learning all of those things is great and that's the complexity that makes the game great but it also presents a challenge to new players where everybody to your point has aha moments but you have to stick around to get to those aha moments and it takes some mental fortitude to keep showing up and keep taking beatings and you know, oh yeah i've i've come for a month and i haven't won a game yet i'm owen 16 but i'm still having a great time mm-hmm. that's a special breed of person just like the person who goes yeah i i get up every day and i play X number of hours. You know, I start at 5 a.m. I practice for three hours every day before I start work because I'm just that committed to the competitive scene. I think both of those people have about the same amount of mental fortitude because taking a beating is just as hard as waking up and playing three hours in the morning before you do anything, in my mind. Yeah, I, I mean, I completely agree. I think that, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think there's a long road to, it, it's a long challenge. And I mean, you kind of spoke to it, actually, your, your point about the, card pool catch up i hadn't really considered that um and with some of these sets going op granted we don't know what's gonna come out presumably we're gonna see Mm -hmm. some of it in some form um but that could present or or maybe not maybe if the power creep continues or if we keep siloing kind of sideways maybe maybe it doesn't matter i don't know um but that's i mean that's that's a fair point as well if you because i i think that that's I, I don't really want to get into the finance side of it, but I, I do think that that was a point that many people had maybe eight months ago when some of this stuff was still hard to find, eight, whatever it was, right? When before Crucible Unlimited and all that yeah. came out and people physically couldn't get what they needed. I think that was a fair point as well. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, your, your point is really good. I mean, you, you can only take it on the chin so many times before you go find an alternative. So yeah. So something for the more simple or straightforward, something that maybe just presents itself as more casual friendly if you're trying to be casual, mm-hmm. because that ultimately is what it comes down to is what are you coming to the table for? Why do you sit down every week? Is it to play with your friends? If they're all playing, it's probably easier to take it on the chin if you're just hanging out with your buddies, because 
you're coming to hang out with your friends, but if you're coming to be just a casual who enjoys the art in the game and the style of play, but you're playing with a maybe a suboptimal deck because you know I don't you don't want to buy full play sets of all your majestics and you don't feel like opening boxes, you don't have all of your legendary equipment. It's like one or two of those cards. I always tell people like one one or two of those cards that make a difference. One play set might not make a huge difference, but if you don't have any of them and you're just slowly trying to accrue them it does make a significant de difference in how quickly that deck kind of hums and also to some degree to your point i think one of the issues now is that if you come in and you immediately play one of the new heroes and you're like oh yeah i want to play briar you just kind of stumble on a deck that's relatively cheap to build and has a pretty significant power level Whereas if you come in and go, oh man, I really like the art style, so I started buying without a lot of, you know, backing or anybody helping me. I started buying brute cards because I, right. I think Reinar looks cool. You, you're gonna find out pretty quickly that you're not just taking it on the chin because you're new, but you're kind of taking it on the chin because your deck into the field is just bad. So that is kind of a feel bad too. So if you if you approach the game incorrectly. And you just come in without any backing and any buddies to teach you or looking up anything on YouTube to learn where the tiers, tiers are of the heroes. And you accidentally picked the wrong hero. You might just dump a bunch of money into a suboptimal hero. And then you're super taking a beating on the chin. And you might just be looking at like, I think I'm just going to I think I'm gonna t keep taking a beating. Even if I'm good, I think I still lose. And that's kind of brutal, too. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're, that's... I mean, and even if, you know, someone's saying, well, then just do your research. I mean, I, I think that's fair. Uh, but but I, I mean, a lot of times we'll see that the people who pick up these games, they pick up the hero they do because they open the first legendary and whatever. I mean, that's very yeah, common, right? Totally. They they open a box and they're like, oh, my God, I got the scabbies. And now they're a root player, right? I mean, that's yeah. how it works a lot, right? So, yeah, I, I mean, I get that, too. Um, so one advantage... I've, I was just thinking while you were talking, one of the advantages that Flesh and Blood does have uh, is that the games often look a lot closer than they really are, which I think can help new players a little bit, right? I mean, there's, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of times you'll, game, games will close within six to eight health, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, yep. or, 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 or less, right? But even, but just because I got you within eight health of me doesn't mean that you weren't in control the whole game, Right. Um, but yeah. I, th I think that a lot of times necessarily it's like, oh man, I almost got you. I got you to four health. And it's like, well, true. And, and you just don't have to say, but you did it. Right. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I was just thinking about that. Cause you were talking about like yeah. the board state and stuff and like, you know, in, in a magic, sometimes you're just like, yep, there's, I just concede. Right. And in flesh and blood, you're always like, well, I, he could, you know, draw all non-attack actions next time. And then maybe I can swing back. Um, oh I man, mean, I got him down to four. As a, as a Kano player and somebody who loves to play Kano, I will say most of the games that I win look very close, but it's because I basically have to let you kill me. Mm -hmm. to, I, I need you to just kind of vomit your hand on the table and go, okay, so you have no cards left in hand. You have one floating, and this is the thing that's going to kill me. All right, now I have to kill you really fast before you kill me. And then, like, they, you, I had lethal on the table. I was so close, man. If I had one more turn, it's like, I yeah, you did. Yep. You did. Congratulations. Good game, man. Good yeah. game. And it's like, as a Kano player, I let you. I I need to let you have that, right? And as and sometimes as a like when you're playing Bravo or Oldham, some of those decks, like you're letting people do a bunch of damage so that you can finish them with that like big gigantic attack. And it's to your point. Sometimes to to sometimes to kill somebody, you got to take ten damage, right? Which shoves you into the single digits. But you took it knowing, well, yeah, I'm going to kill them next turn, like. You're holding your Dorinthia, and you're holding the Iron Song determination and two pumps. You're like, I, I'm going to take whatever they have because I can do twelve dominated next turn without you know any issues. And it it looks close. It feels good. That's that's definitely a benefit, right? That's like one way that they've kind of built in a mechanic to to suck in newer players. Man, I'm always close. I'm always close. Yeah, that, I mean, so I, I you know I, I always think that's interesting. I mean, and. I, kind of a side topic, but while we're on it, one of the things I do appreciate about flesh and blood in terms of teaching new players and letting new players come into these is, you know, a lot of games, there's the people who like to play with their food and in flesh and blood, you, you can't really do that. Right. For, for the most part, yeah. it's like, Oh, I'm going to play some more creatures and not attack or something like that. That's not really a thing here. Like if you don't attack, like yeah. I kind of get to. So 
Yeah. Um, that is, that is a nice thing that, um, you know, you don't have to sit there and get beat for longer yet. We at least get to lose. So <laughs> <that's>, that helps. <laughs> so, okay. Fair enough. Uh, so it, it, I mean, in, in other games, I mean, you, you were talking about DVS and kind of the catch up there was, was there a similar problem in DBS or I mean, not problem, but there was there, were there similar challenges in DBS or, or was the ability to kind of do this horizontal design, which we're starting to see in flesh and blood with the talents and stuff. Did that help kind of mitigate that to a certain degree? I think yes and no. I, there were some of the issues in, in um, DBS are things that they're resolving kind of the same way in fab, which is, even though they're presenting a new, like a new guardian old him. I remember when we first started building old him, you know, as somebody who is very much um, a guardian player in Bravo, right? I've, I've played Bravo for a long time. That's, that's what I played at Nats. That's what I played in Vegas at the calling. I love to play Bravo. When old him was spoiled, I did a lot of like shoving Bravo mechanics into old him because I thought he's a guardian. I'm just going to play him like a guardian. And then you realize very quickly as the deck kind of fleshes itself out, you don't end up with a lot of Bravo cards in Oldham. And he becomes, while a guardian, his own archetype. The same thing happened with Bolton. Even though he was a warrior, he ended up with effectively zero Dorinthia cards. There was almost no overlap. Shunt, the two and that's heroes. about it, right? Right, yeah. yeah. And, and, I, and it's like, that's, a, that's effectively for them most of the time a sideboard card. That's a card that they just go, oh, this is for matchups where they're going to try and go tall on me to rip my hand i just need to be able to have shunts in my arsenal so i can skirt dominates and it's like little tech pieces that were good in the other one that just happened to kind of move over staunch response and bravo maybe it's just the defense reactions that are always good that's maybe that's what we're learning from that uh, <laughs> but like the archetypal thing is actually a great kind of solution to it where you're not having to pick up a whole suite of all the toys from previous stuff CBS ran into the issue that a lot of times like staple cards were relatively expensive and transferred over. They would build new archetypes, which is a good solution, but then you needed a playset from last set, a playset from four sets ago, and those cards were in DBS a playset was four, and those cards could be twenty five dollars a piece. So you would sink hundreds of dollars into staples to play the color you wanted to, even though most of the deck was from a new set. I see. I well, I mean, CNC it, and Easter egg, right? But, but yeah, right. It's it. Yeah. There are some similarities in that. I think one of the benefits in Fab is that oftentimes those staples aren't for a color or an archetype per se. Because in DBS, like you would buy blue staples or green staples, and then if the next set came out and you're like, oh, my favorite character is a different color, it's like, God, do I really want to sink three hundred dollars into staples for that color? I see. Whereas in Fab, to your point. Like, I have to buy CNCs and E-Strikes. I have to buy a tunic and a skull cap if I really want all those pieces. But realistically, those cards are good no matter what hero I play. They can theoretically go in all their decks because they're generics. They feel better. Now, it does feel bad if you buy, like, tectonic plating, and then you decide, like, next set, you're like, oh, you know, my hero maybe worked his way out. He's not as good now, and now I need to buy the legendary for another class. But if you just are kind of married to your class, realistically... The only thing that doesn't carry is like the class specific equipment a lot of times, but you know, you, you got a tunic. Cool. You can pretty much put that in any deck. You're good to go. So at least like some of that thing, like that's one thing that while, while it can be a little bit of a sore point for some people that say, well, you know, I opened one E strike. Now do I buy two more? Or do I just play with my one? It's cause it's expensive. I don't have the money to buy the other ones. It's like, I mean, that, that's up to you at that point. But I understand that frustration, but at least it's good in every deck. You can play right. it. any hero. You could just shove an E-Strike in it. You don't have to think twice about it. And I think that that's a good solution. Now, again, it's kind of leaning market talk, but I do think a solution. some of the solutions of those things as they work out over time, I think they'll resolve it. I mean, they've already tried with Skullcap immediately with Everfest, but I think we'll see solutions to some of those cards eventually. Maybe they just get power crept. I don't know how you power creep. CNC, but <laughs> I mean, you, you you reprint it. But I think they have done some good work with like the archetypal stuff. But it it does present a little bit of a challenge. But I think that Fab has done a maybe a better job than other games because they print things as generics a lot of times that are just mm -hmm. universally powerful. Yeah. Or well, or I mean, it, the counterpoint there is, or maybe that's just the way it worked out. 
but yeah um, just stumbled across it yeah but i i don't think that's an accident right i mean just the way those work they're not fundamentally yeah. towards any class but and i mean to 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 be fair not all classes used to before prism not all classes used to play them right right yeah so um yeah, interesting. So from, uh, you know, another thing that you and I were talking about before we started hitting the record button was, um, you know, we used to steer, or at least I, I know I did, I used to steer my new players towards Ira, right? And I know that's a dirty, dirty word in the world right now. <laughs> but part of the reason we stirred, st- st- stirred them, I, part steered, of the reason we steered st- them there <laughs> was because uh, she was pretty simple, consistent, and, and relative. I mean, she was, she was simple, consistent, and they could get reps right. with her just by doing what she did, right? And, um, you know, is Briar just that new light lightning, Cheerios, Briar, whatever the kids are calling it these days, is that just the new the new way to put your new players, even though it might hurt you a little bit on the inside? Like, is that just the way to go? Or, I mean, I, I think that it's – I think it's good. I, I personally am definitely one of those people who I, – I don't care. I, I particularly don't care about Briar. I think that – it's up to the players if they really hate her to find solutions more than to fix her. I know that that's like another conversation in and of itself, mm-hmm. but I I think that the immediate thing is well, let's get them a, a hero they they can play long term so they can get all the staples. But realistically, things like skull cap or tunic or grasp are good in her, but they're not necessary. Like they don't she doesn't require those cards to be good. They're just beneficial cards because. She almost ne- I mean, she makes a rune chant sometimes, but realistically, it's good because it blocks for three. Same with Skull Cap. Tunic is great because of the resource, but you just run Aether Iron Weave. You can run a, a ton of different options for the hood. I mean, she has so much go again. You could just run Crown of Dichotomy and put stuff back on top. There's lots of options for her to replace the equipment relatively efficiently mm-hmm. and still be good. And then CNC is a card that hilariously enough is like a sideboard card in her it's good in certain matchups and bad in a lot so people don't even run it so it's such a cheap deck to build and it's an easy way to get people into the game and mechanically you can the hardest thing to do in this game or one of the hardest things to do is to pitch stack for late game and with briar you just go look you don't have to think about anything except do you block or not and then just puke your cards on the table if you just sequence them the most and you learn over time then proper sequencing how to efficiently sequence to get the best out of your cards without having to overthink about what you're going to do late game and those things i think to your point that's probably the most important thing is the hardest part about fab is all of the the layers of things that you're trying to think about and you're over complicating now i got to pitch this to pay for that to do this and i do that it's like okay this deck you're really not going to (laughs) pitch like don't even (laughs) don't worry so much about pitching at the end, you might pitch a red card to swing this little sword here. Other than that, you're pretty much just going to go zero cost, zero cost, zero cost. And it teaches them mechanically the game. And I think that that's a good thing. I don't mm-hmm. think it's a bad thing to have a cheap deck. It To me, it we've talked about this you know, on, on our podcast. It's red deck wins. Mm-hmm. That's what it is. And it's funny because I've never even been a big Magic player, but I know everybody hates red deck wins. I didn't even play Magic competitively, but I know people hate Red Deck wins. And I think for some people, it just brings flashbacks, and that's why they're sour grapes about it. Because it's like, oh, I hate this archetype. But it's like, it's aggro. Aggro is the is is easier to play. It's It doesn't require a long-term strategy. It requires you kill your opponent as fast as possible. That's pretty much it. Mm-hmm. You can think about other things later. Just try to kill your opponent as fast as possible. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I don't think that it's a terrible thing to have in the game because we're slowly seeing already, again, if people would hindsight this thing, Briar early on, really oppressive, and already we're seeing a tick back in Briar being played as Lightning Shears Briar because people are finding solutions Mm -hmm. and building solutions. And it takes time to find solutions to decks. So I think that the deck is a good entry point and it power wise is starting to temper already. Mm-hmm. So it, it's even it's an even better solution because it doesn't to your point, it doesn't feel quite as bad to give somebody the deck if you know you're not gonna get throttled by it the first time they play it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean the I, I don't I don't mind talking about the Briar thing. I mean I, I don't uh you know, I know that that was quite the conversation this week. I don't personally think Briar 
should be, I don't necessarily think she should be touched. I mean, it's for, certainly not in the middle of the season, right? Which was our argument. So I, I'm all about that. I, I don't know whether she needs touched or not. Uh, but one of the things I think is getting left out of the conversations at large is that there's a difference between competitive play at the high level where things can be balanced within a meta and what happens at locals, right? And, you know, I know that you guys up there, you have a pretty impressive local scene in terms of skill cap and you can go play every night. But there's there's a lot of locals that, you know, when you see a deck like an Ira or you see a deck like a Briar that you can put together for, Honestly, can't you put Briar together for like twenty bucks? Probably, right? Like, probably. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how much Plunder Run is, but like, if you're skipping out on those, you can probably throw a pretty decent subpar list together for twenty, thirty bucks, right? And pretty much the same oh, with yeah. Ira for the most part, right? So, I mean, that's very attractive at the local levels because it's kind of your on mass entry point, for for lack of a better term. And I do think that was relevant to. You know, aside from your CNCs and your Easter eggs and stuff, I do think that was relevant to why it hit so hard early, plus the aggro thing you know, right? So, you know, while Oldham, who's a very expensive deck, or at least he, I mean, not in general fab terms, but he's a lot more expensive than Briar is, right? You uh, you compare him plus this the reps you would need with him versus everything else, and yeah, at the competitive level, sure, it works out, but at the local levels, it ends up being... 60% Briar. So, uh, and I say that again, I, I'm not complaining here. I just want to make sure that that's comprehended in the conversations. Cause I think a lot of people it's like, well, look, it's, you know, if we look at the nationals results, it's here, it's here, it's here. You know, the calling was won by Oldham, but then the people who are complaining or giving their feedback, whatever, they, they might've just come from a local where it was seven Briars out of eight people mm-hmm. or something. Right. So, yeah. um, Andrew mini rant over. I think we just need to try and put each other on the, and, and by you, by each other, I don't mean you and me. Like I just mean across the community, yeah, I think we need to yeah. try and kind of compromise that different people might be coming from different positions yeah. um, and perceptions. So, yeah, I, I think that's, I think that's actually like a really valid point that honestly, sometimes, like you said, I exist in a meta where, it's really wide in terms of representation, mainly because it's so big. We run, I think right now we've in a seven, in seven days, we, I think we have like nine or 10 armories that run locally, uh, multiple nights a week. We have two, most of those don't, it's not like firing with four people and four people. We're talking about some of those, like on a, on a normal Sunday, we have two armories that run basically simultaneously one starts at one at one at two so you can't play them both basically and um actually sunday we have three now <laughs> we got a we got a third local on sunday if, if that wasn't enough so we have we have two in the day one one at one one at two and then one at five at night or six at night so you can play in one of the day ones and then at night one if you want but during the day one of them will fire with 10 one of them will fire with eight that's a pretty normal sunday afternoon here and because of that, because people play so much, you get a lot of reps into decks. And I think to your point, we might get skewed because less people play Briar because more people have experience into it. So it's not a gimme. Like if you show up with Lightning Briar, it's no gimme, especially because we actually have some pretty skilled Kano pilots here. And I don't know if people realize how good of a matchup Kano can have into just pure zero cost Briar. Because if you're racing, if they can't block Arcane, Nobody nobody races like Kano. If you're going to take it all, Blazing Aether gets exponentially better. Because, oh, you took four. Oh, you took six. Well, now you take another ten. I just took half your life, but you only took 12 of mine. So mm. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm ahead now. So because we have so many people like that or people who play Oldham and Bravo and all these different things, we, we kind of see a different... I, I can sometimes definitely be skewed in the opposite direction of the people who are frustrated by the fact that they're going to their one locals a week. There are 10 people and seven of them brought Briar because they're trying to win and get access to the one single cold foil that they get given mm-hmm. away a week. And that can definitely be part of it too. And that's totally fair. I can get the frustration of that again, to the point of we have like nine or 10, whatever locals a week 
that's a lot of opportunities to win those cold foils and get access to that stuff that people are like, I, I only get one shot, man. I get one shot a week at that cold foil. I'm taking Briar. I'm not playing some experimental deck because I want the prizes. I, I want them. And I get that because the prizes have they have value. Mm -hmm. There's market value for them. Absolutely. You can turn you that first week Rosetta came out, you could have turned one of them into an E-Strike in, in a heartbeat. And I think that, that there's value in that. And I get that. For people who don't want to spend cash on an E-Strike, if you can get a cold foil Rosetta and turn it into an E-Strike in a heartbeat, it's smart. I get it. I get why you, you sleeved up Briar. But again, to your point, I get the other side of that frustration mm -hmm. where you're like, man, I'm just trying to go play games with my friends. It just everybody is playing Briar. Can you just play something else? And those people wanting to see something banned so maybe they can see some of their deck. I get it. Like, I, I really do. I, I get the frustration of that. I get that it's hard when you've only got one or two locals a week and it's just all you see. It gets old. It gets tired. It's like seeing Ira and Blitz all over again. I think everyone's just having, like, flashbacks. It's like everyone has Ira PTSD. They're just like, they look at Briar and it's just like they have flashes. Yep. It's just like Ira's face showing up on top of Briar's. I, I, I actually agree with you. I, I think that's the real reason people are... Well, maybe not the real reason, but I think that's a huge factor in this is Briar does really smell a lot like Ira, right? And in, in a lot of different yeah. ways. And I, I know we're supposed to say, well, she's kind of like Chain because of like the numbers and stuff. But like, if you really just look at how the decks play and a, a lower skill level, which feeds into our conversation, right? It's, yeah. but, it, but it doesn't, it doesn't mean it's a bad thing. And, and just to be clear, everybody out there, I, I don't, I don't personally know that she needs changed. Um, that's my position on it today and has been for a while, despite, despite what other people have tried to put into my mouth. That's, that's not the case. Right. Um, yeah. but, but like I said, I'm just trying to understand this from multiple perspectives, which I think is, I think is what we should all do personally, but you gotta, you gotta do you right. So, yeah. um, yeah, inter in interesting. Yeah. So, uh, I kind of lost, I'll be honest, I kind of lost track of our uh, conversation on the, <laughs> the the new player thing. But I mean, I, I think that f fed into it and is relevant. So Yeah, I th especially if you're a new player. If you're a new player and you, I, I think that E-Strike for Rosetta trade is like a very real thing for a new player who doesn't want to spend the money on those cards but would like access to those cards. Like if you're new to Fab and you haven't been around forever and you didn't get a chance early on to open a bunch of welcome to wraith and now especially now that things like that are out of print it's maybe you can still get it at your game store maybe you can't again you know we i, I feel definitely privileged in the fact that we have a lot of game stores who i went to a game store last night played in an armory they had crucible sitting out as prize packs you could pick they our wow. stores that have access to that stuff are more than happy none of them are even marking it up it's all still at the price it was prior to the out of print announcement like you can still buy boxes of it at the same you could buy it beforehand. It's the same cost. Some of them are a little higher if you buy sealed boxes, but they give away those packs as as price for. A lot of people buy like you win and they'll grab Welcome to Wraith or Arcane. It's like if I get the skull cap or I get the tunic, man, I, that was like the armory of all armories. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have that situation again, if you don't have that situation, if you got one store, it's the only one you're going to. You can't even buy Welcome to Wraith anymore. It's you know that your shot to get e strikes without spending cash might be winning your Rosetta and then turning it into an e strike. And I understand sleeving up Briar. It makes sense as a new player to put Briar together because, to your point, if you just don't put in the e strikes, I mean, Plunder Run is the most expensive card of the deck. It's Snatches and Scar for Scars and Ravenous Rabbles and Plunder Runs and Ball Lightnings. All, it's all commons and rares. It's easy to get your hands on, and you're not really having to work too hard to put the deck together. You can put it together off TCG Player for probably 30 bucks max if you're just using some... And you don't even need the Mac Daddy equipment. It's just extra block, which right. you're not blocking anyway. It's the only cards you're blocking with in the deck. So, I yeah, I, I get it. I, I understand the appeal and the allure to new players, and I think that, honestly, it's... It's a good thing to have access to that stuff, to, mm -hmm. to have it for new players. I think a deck like that is good because one of the complaints that sometimes you have when you talk to somebody who's new to Fab is they look at the list, they see the equipment cost, or they see the C, a, a list with three CNCs, and it becomes very difficult to justify those the, the $500 
or the six hundred dollars mm-hmm. or whatever to to put that deck list together. It's it's tough, and having a deck like Briar is appealing, which is probably long term good for the game. Having those decks that get people in, get people hooked, because realistically, somebody who gets in and loves the mechanics of the game and plays a bunch of Briar, they're going to probably find their way onto another deck when they realize that those decks have answers and those decks have solutions to them and then they're hooked on briar they're hooked on the game they love the feeling they like the the nature of the game and then they switch to something else and everybody's happy because now you're not playing another briar they're hooked on the game and they're staying in and we're all happy we've got a a new player that sticks with the game and they're not playing briar everybody wins right like Mm -hmm. that's the that's like the penultimate prize a new player transitioned to a permanent player, and they transitioned off a of Briar. Now, now everybody's happy, not just the new player. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, the the, the one counterpoint, or not, it's not a counterpoint, but the, the one thing I would like to add in terms of, I mean, you know, you like both of us said, yeah, we'd throw them on Ira, we'd throw them on Briar. I think the one disadvantage to throwing them on Briar, like Lightning Briar versus like Ira, is you still learned how to block when you were playing Ira, and like. Yeah. I don't really think you learn how to block very well when you're playing Lightning Briar, right? <laughs> I mean, so, you don't have to, yeah. Right, yeah, so I, I do think to. that's, that's one. Problem. I do think that's one uh, slight negative there from the entry player standpoint. But you know, like you said, if they can convert, they'll they'll figure it out quick because it's it's very yeah. you know most most players pick up two heroes at some point within being new. But then I guess at that point they're not necessarily a new player anymore because they're hooked. So so fair enough. So fair enough. So. Um, one more thing, and then I'll I'll let you get out of here. But you know, as as we were talking about the the kind of the trickle down effect from competitive to locals, do you think that one of the reasons we're seeing such a outcry right now or whatever is because we didn't really get to finish the competitive season cycle, so we're kind of left with this. That that's kind of how I see it. Is like early on, like you said, aggro early, briar early, and then we didn't really get to see for the most part the counter punch because those events haven't Mm. happened yet. Um, So what everyone's seeing now is they're seeing the early tournament data, which is, it's, it's completely valid numbers. Like she dominated early tournament data. There's no arguing with that. It's data. The, the question would be if we had been able to finish said season, what would the data look like? But now we're in this like weird holiday lull where we haven't. So do you think that, do you think that's leading to some of this that it's just like this lull where no one's been basically shown the light yet um or do you think it just is that she's easy and cheap because because that's i mean that's that's fair i like like my women easy and cheap right (laughs) yeah i i definitely think it is i think to some degree it's the fact that the meta has kind of stagnated in people's eyes and we've kind of hit this holiday lull where there's no competitive events but we didn't get a resolution to the season Mm -hmm. and we're still waiting forever i think there's that some of it is the board thing we're just kind of everyone sitting around on their hands they don't have anything else to do so they're trying to find something to talk about or they're they're stuck just stewing in frustration towards briar and there's no data to show the opposite side of it where she's beatable and i think some of that is it happened so quickly right like her emergence on the scene into her surge into power and even at u.s nationals we already saw people had with that little time started to find solutions mm-hmm. like ice Alexi and oldham and then i think when it comes down to it, it it's we sit in kind of an interesting situation in this game where new zealand who in a normal game and this is no shot at new zealand i've Tons of friends there. Love those guys. They have some of the best players in the world who I owe a lot of my ability to play this game to. But in a lot of games, they wouldn't be seen as like a premier spot for a Nationals. Like people wouldn't be waiting for New Zealand Nationals, maybe in Magic or something, just purely based on the size. But in Fab, because that's like, that's where the game started. That's where like a lot of the best players in the world live. That's that's a premier Nationals and everybody is waiting a lot of times with like bated breath to see what will the best players in New Zealand do and how will they combat Briar? How will people like Matt Rogers and Kale McCreef take down the beast that is Briar? And 
be because we didn't get the resolution of seeing some of the best players in the world in like New Zealand and Australia who had access to the game from the beginning and are some of our most skilled players, we haven't seen their attack, like their counterpunch to your point, right? We haven't seen their counterpunch to Briar. So we're left with this bad taste in our mouth like she's just the best deck. We're never going to get rid of her. She's going to haunt our dreams forever. She's going to be in our nightmares just every night. I'm going to wake up in a cold sweat thinking about Snatch for 7 with Go again. And I'm never going to be able to... Yeah. Oh, God. I'm, okay, I blocked 7. Oh, God, lightning press. And just wake up, you know, screaming in my bed and my <laughs> wife has to grab, you know. And, and it's like, we haven't seen... What's the solution to that? How do we fix that? What do I need to take to locals to beat that? And we've had conversations. Like, that's what it's come down to now is... Normally, we would be able to talk about it, but that's the other issue is, from what I understand, New Zealand and Australia have found solutions to her. Like, New Zealand, I, I know some of the guys there, and all of them are confident that there are plenty of answers to her. The problem is, they're not telling anybody, as they should not, because yeah, they fair, haven't that's played fair. nationals yet. They, yeah. shouldn't say a, they shouldn't say a word about it, and I would never ask them to. And... That's part of the issue, too, is normally you wait for good players to show you how to beat the best deck. Like, what's their counterpunch? Now, how do I just put that deck together and feel like I have a fighting chance? But we haven't seen that, so now we're sitting around. Just people are still stewing because they haven't been given the answers to the test. And I think that that sounds bad. And again, I think some people will like, oh, well, I always find solutions. My Okay, that's fine. Congratulations. You're smarter than everybody else in the room. I always tell people I'm not every list I've ever played at a high level event that I've done well with was somebody else's list because most of us aren't good enough players to also be able to build those decks. And we're waiting to see those answers. And I think once we see those answers, I think that'll do a lot to temper her and potentially kind of push her back a little bit and mm -hmm. maybe come the release of Everfest, you know, people, people will probably credit some of it to Everfest and that will be the kind of peculiar thing about it is the next time we have a round of competitive events it'll be on the Everfest meta and people go oh yeah Everfest came out that's why Briar got tempered because they didn't ban anything but it was Everfest that helped it. it's like well was it or did we see solutions that we copied and then she got tempered and then Everfest just kind of became our excuse or a reasoning behind it yeah, I, I think that's a good point. I, I mean, I have my own opinions there on, you know, kind of how we got to where we are in terms of what was probably and what wasn't probably play tested. So I don't know that the next set does or does not fix it. But um, yeah. I, I think your point. Yeah, I mean, it's so if the, and, and the, the other thing is, right, it's not even about we'll take the personally aspect out of it. It's not even about someone showing you how to play the deck. It's the fact that when it's been demonstrated, that deck can be beat consistently, less people are going to play it. Right, yep. regardless of whether you're going to play the counterpunch or not. So, you know, and, and again, that goes back to my earlier point about, you know, th there being a very real trickle down effect to locals that is not always directly one to one for what you would expect at the competitive scene or the, you know, waiting for game on the TTS Discord that you play 25 games a day on, right? So it's, um, yeah, I, it's just, it's just very interesting to me. Because um, I mean, it it all fits into new player attitude, and but but like we said, it, it's not a bad. I I because I, I agree. I don't think Ira was a bad thing. I think Ira fatigue was a bad thing. I don't think Ira was a, was a bad thing to have. I don't think Briar is a bad thing to have. I think it's what the community does with it that becomes the problem, right? I mean, if you're a top tier yeah. guy and you're still playing that deck because you want to get a cold foil every week, I, I respect that. But at some point, like, it's not good for your meta to have the same person winning the armory every week. Like, it's it's not a good thing, right, in the grand scheme yeah. of your local meta. So, especially if it's the same guy. If it's, you know, five of you are yeah. swapping wins or something that's different. But if, like, you go and you just crush face every single week, you're probably going to have a smaller meta than you could have. I mean, that's just the truth. Yeah. Yeah. So. But. Yeah, everybody, everybody, wants, everybody wants to beat the, the Goliath, but oftentimes nobody nobody can or just somebody can eventually but that's the problem is if the game if you're if your local dies out because everyone's frustrated with it mm -hmm. and you kind of it's a self you know defeating thing where just going and wrecking face every week you're like yeah i'm the champion i'm the best but then 
nobody's coming back because they're frustrated with right. you always bullying them. Right. It's it's not a it's not a good thing long term. Definitely. Right. And then and then oftentimes in these games, the deck that that person's piloting becomes right. It's not that Blake's a great player. It's that Blake plays friggin' Ira every week, and Ira's just broken. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's that's just kind of the natural turtling that we have. Right. So, I mean, I I think there's a fair amount of it, a fair amount of it there. Um, But I don't know. That's just me and my own perceptions of my perceptions. Right. So. So it's it's definitely easy in those situations to start to put the onus on the deck or something being broken. And then to your point, if if I'm going well, Ira's broken or Briar's broken. It couldn't. It it stops even being the player and starts being my frustration with the deck, mm-hmm. and then that spills over when I go on Facebook and I see it winning. Now I'm just frustrated, and, and I feel the need to write my dissertation on Facebook about why Briar is broken and how they should have fixed her and done this, that, and another thing. And it all stems back from the same issue of one person playing it because no one's been given answers, or I think maybe the best thing I I think one of the best counters to that argument that we need someone to answer it is just to your point. I don't need a deck to play that answer is it. I just need it to be answered. Right. It just needs to exist. It just needs to exist. Yeah. 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 And it needs to exist in a wider version than Isaac playing ice Lexi because one guy doing it does not solve the problem. But if you see one diverse top eight where Briar just doesn't, wreck face all of a sudden people go oh man maybe there's another deck i should sleeve up instead or maybe there's a deck maybe i shouldn't play that deck anymore because people are going to start bringing answers and you start to just just in case everyone starts to bring the answers you need to at least have another deck sleeved up and you're not just showing up with it every week you're kind of bringing something else what's the deck that answers that deck and that's the that's where you want to exist is if ice lexi answers briar and enough people are bringing it, what's the thing that answers Ice Lexi? Because I know so-and-so is going to try to answer my deck, so I'm going to I'm gonna right. play 5D chess. They're playing 4D chess. I'm playing 5D chess, and I'm going to bring the answer to the answer that they're bringing to answer me. And that's why Briar's going to end up winning New Zealand Nationals because they're all going <laughs> to out-meta themselves, and then somebody's going <laughs> to slip. I mean, I'm just, I'm just joking, to be clear here, but yeah. um, it's... I mean, it, it could happen, right? They're like, oh, yeah. Old, Oldham's the answer. I've got it down. We're just going to rampart or whatever. They're, uh, that's not the answer, I don't think, by yeah. the way. But yeah. I'm just saying, right? Yeah. yeah. I'm this, just, and then Briar right to the top. <laughs> if, if someone's looking for, if someone's looking to be really beat up, if you think if you think Cheerios Briar is a bad thing, you should play a Mount Heroic Force of Nature turn. Just one time have someone lay one of those on you, and I'll tell you what. All of a sudden, Cheerios Briar will not be your biggest gripe mm. because one turn of Mount Heroic Force of Nature will make you want to vomit. It's so god awful to play into. It's so painful, but a lot of people don't even know that deck exists because everyone in their meta is playing Cheerios Briar because it's easier to play. <laughs> uh, Earth, Earth Briar is the big one in our. Uh, we had we had five, um, in, myself included, last week in Blitz. We had five Earth Briars out of yeah. nine people. Uh, but that's, yeah. I, I think, also because everybody didn't want to play Cheerios prior, so they just wanted to play. Yeah. yeah but, um, but no, and then Big big Med Sai, Simon, he took down our uh, DC Team Winter Championships, too, with Earth Briar. But it's the same deck he took to the UK Nats, top four, okay. top eight. Yep. So, no, that, that's a very real deck, and it's pretty gross. It's pretty gross. Yeah. And yep. you know who it, else is good? Answers... Viscera is real good, and uh, Runeblades yeah. are good. Runeblades are good. But... Yeah. Little did we know. Yeah. Runeblade was going to be the class of all classes. Yeah. <laughs> Turns out when you can do damage from multiple sources and effectively have two resource pools, that's not a, not a bad thing. So anyway, to deal with. anyway deal with. We're, we're, we're trailing off, but uh, yeah. I think we can put this one to bed. So, I mean, thanks, thanks for popping on. I, I thought it was a unique, um, unique conversation, right? Cause I, I, like I said, I saw it happening and I was like, well, I don't know if the way that this conversation's going is, what I think, but I do think there's a conversation to be had there. So I figured float it your way and uh, see where it went. And hopefully everyone watching thinks it's uh, thinks it was worth their time. So uh, before we get out of here, why don't you go ahead and uh, plug plug your guys' stuff? Yeah, yeah, myself and my uh, my good friends Jason and Dane. We have a channel, Outcast Haven. Uh, we're it's basically all competitive. We do the podcast. 
uh, gameplay. We do a live stream on Tuesdays. Uh, we'll do deck profiles after nationals. We did a handful of them. And uh, yeah, we, we love just talking the competitive side of the game. It's basically all we care about. So we just want to win, baby. Just win, baby. So Outcast Haven over on YouTube. Come check us out if you uh, if you like competitive stuff. Awesome. And they, they do a real good job. And, uh, you know, there's rarely any controversial stuff over there or anything. And uh... <laughs> <laughs> We're we're just super even keeled. We never rock the boat ever, not at all. No, but I mean, re- realistically though, I mean that that was obviously a sarcastic joke. But re- realistically, the three guys play pretty well off each other. You've got, you know, the loose cannon. You've got Mister Practical, and then Blake kind of plays referee. So, um, <laughs> no, it works really well. Go 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 check them out. So, anyway, thank you very much. Uh, is there anything else you wanted to add or say before we get out of here tonight? No, I'm, I'm excited to see. I'm, I mean, the biggest thing I would say is I'm, I'm really excited for the conclusion of national season mm-hmm. because I think it's two very good player bases and uh, it's going to be fun to watch. Yeah. Oh, we did see the uh, the calling uh, Utrecht. Is that how you say it? Utrecht. 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 Yeah, that did get canceled, um, which yeah. is un- That's unfortunate. unfortunate. Yeah. yeah, really unfortunate. Because it would have been very interesting to see how that uh, that turned out. Mm-hmm. But Yeah. Oh, well, because the Europeans always have a slightly different meta, and I always love seeing uh, how that flushes out. So, so. Mm-hmm. Anyway, all right, well, I will let you go, man. I really appreciate you taking time away from the family and your uh, your podcast vacation to uh, slum, it, slum it over here on Dice, Dice Commando. But uh, appreciate it. Uh, one more time, shout out, and you guys say it with me. Go Commando. Go Commando. <laughs>